truly an honor and a privilege uh, to be here to be speaking to such a distinguished audience and uh, to recap some of the things uh, uh, in uh, pediatric acute respiratory distress syndrome and briefly touch upon some of the work that we are doing. In fact, uh, I will give a much more detailed presentation of our own investigational work at the CDI Scientific Symposium uh, next month. So for the purpose of this talk, I thought uh, to lay out a kind of outline for you guys. I'm going to start with the definition and epidemiology of ARDS. We will then talk about the pathophysiology uh, and, uh, and then go move on to management. And then finally, time permitting, I will touch briefly upon some newer potential therapeutic targets and some of the newer therapies that are being uh, developed in ARDS. So I guess this picture speaks for itself. In most people's mind, it evokes the picture of ARDS, and that's absolutely correct. This is typical severe ARDS. But this is not all. ARDS ranges in spectrum very mild to this fulminant uh, 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 bilateral opacities, complete opacification of air spaces in, as seen in this chest X-ray. The definitions of ARDS uh, have evolved over time, and even currently we, we have three well-known definitions that people use, and we'll go through each of these one by one. Historically, ARDS was first defined by Ashbag and Petty uh, years ago. It was a syndrome of severe refractory hypoxemia, and which was, uh, which was seen in patients, initially called with the conditions like shock lung and, uh, and, uh, and uh, before that, uh, uh, other such condition, uh, such names. In 1994, a group of investigators, since mechanical ventilation was becoming routine from the so-called American European Consensus Conference, sat down and came up with this definition of acute lung injury and ARDS. So it was basically defined on the basis of hypoxemia, and that hypoxemia is defined as PAO2 FiO2 ratio of less than 300. So if the inspired, uh, so if the PaO2 on the blood gas divided by the inspired FiO2 that the patient was breathing was less than 300, that would fulfill one of the criteria, that is the criteria for hypoxemia. The second criteria was presence of bilateral infiltrates on a chest X-ray of the kind that you saw before and of any kind of lesser variety also, as long as these infiltrates were new and were on both the sides. And then the third thing was no evidence of left atrial hypertension. So th this has gendered some confusion in people because it doesn't mean that you have to prove there is no left atrial hypertension. It's kind of like the judicial system. If there is no evidence of hyper, uh, left atrial hypertension, then you presume that there is no left atrial hypertension. And as we see, this was fought with a little bit of uh, uh, problems. So when you look at this definition, you see that we, we, we define hypoxemia without taking into any consideration is the patient on mechanical ventilation and what kind of support is he receiving on mechanical ventilation. And the problem with this is that you can alter somebody's PaO2 for the same FiO2 by changing the mechanical ventilation settings and this definition did not take that into account. Law, time and again, people have shown that the inter-observer reliability between different people assessing chest x-rays for bilateral infiltrates is not very high. So there's a fair degree of misclassification when you 
have a non-specific criteria like bilateral infiltrates. And this criteria of no left atrial hypertension, which was defined as PA pressure of less than 18, uh, not PA pressure, left atrial uh, pressure or PA occlusion pressure of less than 18 millimeters. In fact, in documented clinical studies of ARDS, where putting in a swan gans catheter was a part of the trial, people who were categorized as ARDS, about a third of them did in fact have pulmonary artery occlusion pressures of 18. So again, signifying their, that problem with that particular issue. And then there are a couple of things which are general, uh, generally related to this concept of having heterogeneous diseases like ARDS or shock in ICU, which don't define a particular condition, but are rather a syndrome that a diverse group of illnesses will contribute to this condition. And finally, the way hypoxia is defined in all of these definitions of ARDS, remember that it is hypoxia, but not oxygen delivery. And as an intensivist, I would like to believe that ultimately it is the oxygen delivery that matters and not just the arterial PO2. So then a group of people got together after about 20 years or so in 2014 and decided we needed to come up with some updates to this uh, definition of ARDS. So no longer was ARDS broken into ALI, which was PF ratio of 300 to 200, and ARDS, which was PF ratio of less than 200. Everything below 300 was ARDS, and it was categorized as mild, moderate, or severe, depending on whether the, let me try, all right, okay. So I'm told I should use the mouse so that other people, so basically it got categorized as from 300 to 200, you would call it mild, from 200 to 100, moderate, and less than 100, severe. And it made sense because the mortality of patients, depending on this classification, varied. There was a step up in mortality, whether you were mild, moderate, or severe. In terms of timing, they made a definition, uh, stricter definition, that it had to be within one week of onset of a precipitating cause, whether it was pneumonia or whether it was uh, sepsis or trauma. So, again, so the, what the Berlin definition addressed is it, it gave us a time frame. It did, I will have to use the pointer. It had three mutually subgroups based on the, on the PF ratio, and it added a criteria that the minimum PEEP that these patients had to be was five or more. So now there was a PEEP requirement in addition to the PF uh, requirement. And they clarified that chest X-ray would include only X, uh, bilateral infiltrates that were not explained by collapse or atelectasis. And the pulmonary wedge pressure uh, uh, of less than 18, that requirement was completely reduced, uh, taken away. So pediatricians were not to be left behind. In 2014, there was a consensus among us pediatricians that this particular Berlin definition did not meet all the requirements for ARDS as we see in children today. And some of the issues were that a lot of our patients with ARDS no longer go on to get mechanical ventilation and have non-invasive ventilation. And there was no adjustment for that in the Berlin definition. A number of ICUs nowadays don't use blood gases. And the definition that requires PO2 needs you to obtain an arterial blood gas. Nowadays, we uh, bank more and more on non-invasive measurements, like saturations, and there was no accommodation for that. Special populations in children, our ARDS, a significant fraction has cyanotic heart disease or chronic lung disease. And the Berlin definition does not account for that. And the vent settings, they did talk about PEEP, 
But then PEEP is not the only thing that matters when you have patients on mechanical ventilation. And it is the PIP and the I-time and E-time. So we came up with a better measure of vent settings and decided to use mean airway pressure. So for oxygenation, those of you who are in neonatology or pediatric ICU know that OI is a OI is a single major which takes into account both vent settings as mean airway pressure and the PF ratio. And if PF ratio was not available, we decided to uh, use something called a saturation FiO2 ratio where the PaO2 would be substituted by saturation on pulse ox and came up with equal numbers. And so then this was the leak definition of uh, ARDS, which includes patients within seven days of a known clinical insult. It, it, it takes into account uh, oh, uh, for oxygenation, we no longer use just the PF ratio or the SF ratio, but an OI, which is a conglomerate of vent settings and the oxygenation. So OI of four, eight, and 16 as mild, moderate, or severe for those who are on mechanical ventilation. Remember, you can't obtain an OI on patients that are not mechanically ventilated but are on CPAP. There we chose to use the Berlin definition of CPAP of more than five. And there was extra criteria for cyanotic heart disease, chronic heart disease, and left ventricular definition, which essentially said if there was a change from baseline, then those criteria could be used to classify patients on ARDS. So, one big change that also was made as a result of this was that whole gray area of bilateral versus unilateral infiltrates that was taken away, and any new infiltrate would classify as pediatric ARDS. So for those of you who are not every day in the ICUs, so a child, what this translates into, a patient with pneumonia who's sitting in on your floor, and inspiring on CPAP with a FiO2 of more than 50%, and if a SAT is 92%, would be ARDS by these criteria. Just to give you an example of that this casts a broader net, and, and, and that, that uh, the, to be aware of, uh, of early transfers and early interventions and lung protective strategies in these patients with early ARDS before they actually proceed on to get ARDS, fulminant ARDS and bad outcomes. So I'm sorry if I confused you and talked about this definition uh, and specifics on end, which is probably of more relevant to intensive care and neonatal intensive care physicians. But remember that the sum is that basically ARDS is a syndrome of acute onset hypoxia. The differences between the definitions are how they define that hypoxia, but it is basically acute onset hypoxia and pulmonary edema or infiltrates that are not from a cardiac cause. So any non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema with hypoxia that meets those definitions is ARDS. And it includes a number of conditions ranging from trauma to sepsis and everything in between. So the splitters, there are lumpers and splitters. Lumpers are people who want to, to to find commonalities between different conditions, and splitters want to find differences between different conditions. And the lumpers would call it uh, like a more of a wastebasket diagnosis of everything that is uh, lung-related and has a certain oxygen requirement. Why do we care about ALI and ARDS? We care because it is a major cause of morbidity and mortality amongst the uh, population in general. And these are some illustrative examples to, to compare it to other well-known conditions that are in uh, the public imagination. So fairly common cause of mortality. But for full disclosure, these numbers are from adults, and uh, adults and children combined. 
when you break it down to just pediatrics, the mortality in pediatrics is not that high, as is for every other condition. In pediatrics, based on this population-based study in Kings County in Seattle, Dr. Zimmerman came up with population-based incidence. This is the only and the first study of its kind, population-based incidence of 12.8 per 100,000. It, it contributed to just about 1 to 7% of PICU admissions. But what, was, what is more important than that is that 30% of PICU deaths are accompanied by ARDS. That is where it, its importance lies. So, and common conditions like sepsis, pneumonia, and or a combination of their, thereof are the more common uh, reasons for getting ARDS. Having alluded to this briefly, ARDS can result from two major types of injuries. The first is direct lung injury. So as you can imagine, things that arise in the lung itself and spread to involve the whole lung. So causes like pneumonia and aspiration. Pathophysiologically, the major consideration here is that it starts on the alveolar side, as you can imagine. So there is injury to alveolar epithelium, and that then uh, spreads across the whole lung, as we will see in a minute versus indirect lung injury, where the main causes are things like sepsis, trauma, transfusion, remote from the lung, there is beginning of injury to the endothelium, which spreads to the pulmonary endothelium, and then that uh, leads to ARDS. This is just uh, more of a textbook description of the causes of direct and indirect lung injury taken from the famous review article from methane, where in NEJM. Common causes, as you can see, are pneumonia, aspiration, less common causes, pulmonary contusion, drowning, inhalation injury, indirect lung injury, again, common causes, sepsis, trauma, shock, less common causes, cardiopulmonary bypass, drug overdose, pancreatitis, etc. This is a table from our own work of 308 patients with pediatric ARDS and the distribution of underlying causes. As you can see, pneumonia by far forms the biggest single cause of ARDS in children, and this has been replicated over and over again in other studies. Aspiration forms 3 to 10 percent in different CDs. In our case, it was about 3 percent, and 21 percent have sepsis. Remember, this is not pneumonia and sepsis. This is just non-pulmonary sepsis, where there is no pneumonia, but it was just pure sepsis and that spread to have uh, ARDS. And then trauma and transfusion-related conditions. So having gone through in uh, the about uh, uh, through definition of epidemiology, let's look at what is actually the pathophysiology of ARDS. So as you guys know, the lung is basically formed mainly of branching airways and that divide and subdivide starting from trachea right up to the terminal bronchiole. And at the end of the terminal bronchiole, you have the sac of, you have the sac of these thin air-walled sacs that are suspended in fluid-filled bunches of capillaries. That is the functional unit of the lung. And most adults have almost 6 billion or so of these units. And it's a wonder of nature that this thin-walled sack of air, which is dry, is totally surrounded by these fluid-filled capillaries. It is thin enough to allow participate in gas exchange, but robust enough to keep complete separation between the aqueous and the liquid <coughs> phases to, it, through which this exchange is taking place. So the alveolus is lined by these thin, flat alveolar epithelial cells, which are generally of two types, type 1 and type 2. The type 2 ones are these thick cuboidal cells that, in addition to doing uh, active fluid transport, also uh, secrete surfactant, which is essential for maintaining the shape of the alveoli, and after injury, will differentiate into type 2 
uh, type 1 cells, these flat squamous cells that are essential for gas transport. And this air-filled sac is surrounded by capillary, which are lined by endothelium, and, 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 and normal Starling's forces make sure that the oncotic pressure will keep all the fluid in the capillaries and the alveolar are dry, except for a mild alveolar liquid um, layer, which is essential for dispersal of uh, surfactant and maintains the alveoli open, but we'll not go into that in detail. So in this milieu, two types of things can happen. You can have cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which is as a result of obstruction to basically pathophysiologically obstruction to pulmonary veins, whether you have left heart failure or mitral stenosis or anything, you are impeding the return of blood from the pulmonary venous circulation, which results in increased hydrostatic pressure within these pulmonary capillaries. And there is a pure filtration of protein poor edema into the capillaries and you get what is commonly known as cardiogenic pulmonary edema as opposed to non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, in which the pressure in the capillaries is normal. So it's not a filtration across a normal barrier, but now the major issue is that the barrier is lost. As a result of infection, as a result of inflammation, this alveolar capillary barrier is no longer as robust as it used to be. So guess what? There is a protein-rich fluid, not protein-poor, protein-rich fluid that is full of inflammatory cells that accumulates in the alveoli. And that is the major difference between hydrostatic and non-hydrostatic pulmonary edema. So the end result of this non-hydrostatic pulmonary edema is that you have these activated neutrophils, activated alveolar macrophages, stoked up inflammation and inflammatory mediators in the alveolus. And people have spent a lifetime, several people have spent lifetimes analyzing what are the different things that are in this alveolar fluid and what is the different role of each of these, which we will not talk about, but some to say that inflammation is uh, geared up. And along with inflammation, there is activation of thrombosis. And when thrombosis is activated, there is laying down a fibrin on these denuded areas. So teleologically, it's a defense mechanism because this leakage of these type 1 cells that are destroyed is prevented by these fibrin layers. And this is what forms the hyaline membrane that, as you remember, hyaline membrane is what newborn uh, infantile AR, uh, respiratory distress syndrome or the the premature babies getting RDS that was initially called hyaline membrane disease because on microscopes these, these, these fibrin strands look like hyaline membranes. Too much of a good thing is bad, so stoking up of this inflammation, is, uh, of this inflammation and coagulation is not just protective but can lead to microvascular thrombosis in the endothelial capillary capillaries, and that can cause differences in ventilation and perfusion ratios. That has implications for hypoxia and other things. In addition, if you see this, uh, the alveolus loses its normal, nice round shape, and that is because of the loss of surfactant. So there is barrier disruption, there is loss of surfactant, there is inflammation and thrombosis, all of them going on at the same time. And what do they lead to? That leads to disruption of the capillary endothelial uh, interface. Disruption of that leads to increased permeability and protein-rich fluid goes out of the capillaries into the alveoli. The alveolar epithelial damage not only disrupts the barrier, but takes away whatever ability the epithelium had to pump out fluid. And so there is, on one hand, alveolar edema formation and flooding, and on the other hand, decreased edema fluid clearance that worsens the pathophysiology. So there are these air-filled sacs that normally should have been air-filled are now fluid-filled and, and, uh, and, and out of shape because of loss of surfactant. 
This results in reduction of the resting lung volumes, loss of compliance, which is how much pressure you need to move a certain amount of air in and out of the lungs, resulting therefore in increased work of breathing, which is manifested as dyspnea. We talked about this, the thrombosis in the vessels leads to ventilation perfusion mismatch that for pulmonary physiologists translates into increased dead space and right to left shunting. Added to all this, there is evidence that there is impaired lymphatic drainage also, adding to this whole fluid up, build up, build up of fluid. So in addition to this, something else is happening. Now we have an open interface. Normally, the lungs are exposed to the environment, but they are sealed off from the circulation because of that alveolar endothelial barrier, wherein that the, the alveolar stuff other than gases cannot go into the capillaries. But that is now lost. You have an open interface between the lungs and the blood. And so there's a two-way spread of both microorganisms and pro-inflammatory mediators from the lung to remotely to the rest parts of the body and vice versa. So depending on whether you have direct lung injury or indirect lung injury, inflammation and infection can move both ways. And that is what leads to a systemic inflammatory response. And keep that in mind, this will, will revisit this. Clinically, patients have severe dyspnea, tachypnea, increased work of breathing, resistant hypoxemia with or without hypercarbia, but hypoxemia is a must. In terms of pulmonary physiology, it results in low lung volumes and decreased FRC decrease uh, loss of compliance, atelectasis, and ventilation perfusion mismatches. For those who are interested in lung volumes, this is a, a, a diagrammatic representation of normal tidal breathing. This is a deep breath, and this would constitute the vital capacity. However, the important thing here is that the amount of air at the end of a forced expiration, the forced residual capacity, uh, uh, the functional residual capacity at the end of the amount of volume in the lung at the end of a normal breath is the functional residual capacity and at the end of a forced breath is residual volume. The functional residual capacity generally is below the closing volume, the volume at which the alveoli completely empty and have to be reinflated. In ARDS, the closing volume is higher than the functional residual capacity. And that imposes additional work of breathing because as you can conceptually understand, if your alveoli are partly full at the end of expiration, when you breathe in, it's easier to open them versus if the alveoli are totally collapsed at the end of expiration expiration. The energy of inertia that it takes to open them each time they open and close is much greater. And plus, there is evidence to show that that opening and closing worsens lung injury. So that is how one of our interventions that is increased PEEP works. It increases the functional residual capacity above the closing volume. So we talked about the acute phase, disruption of the alveolar capillary phase, leakage of protein-rich fluid, release of cytokines, migration of uh, neutrophils. This generally lasts for about a week to 10 days, and a, there's a later repair, reparative phase, which is characterized by fibro uh, proliferation and organization of the lung tissues. So what basically happens is there is reabsorption of the fluid and protein during uh, recovery from lung injury, and this takes different forms. There is diffusion of protein, there is phagocytosis, the apoptosis by neutrophils and alveolar macrophages. There is epithelial repopulation of the, of the surface of the alveolus by type 2 cells my, uh, forming type 1 cells. And then there is involution of those Invol uh, inflammatory cells that had gone into the alveolus through apoptosis and cleared up by the phagocytosis. So if most of the times this resolution re leads to near complete but not complete recovery. But if resolution does not occur, there is disordered collagen uh, deposition leading to extensive lung scarring. 
Microvascular thrombosis can lead to pulmonary hypertension and myocardial dysfunction. Luckily, these complications are not common. But the important concept to remember is that it's a heterogeneous disease. In the same lung, there will be areas that are less affected and other areas that will be much more affected. And I think a classic example of that is seen in neonatal lung disease, recovery from neonatal lung disease, PPD, and things like that. So normal and diseased tissues may exist side to side, and that has its own complications. Very little data on long-term outcomes in children. Some from adults, mostly from Margaret uh, Herridge up in Canada. There are, almost everyone has decreased lung reserves, but not clinically apparent. But a significant portion of people will have reduced FRC, reduced vital capacity, reduced six-minute walk test, and things like that. There are uh, patients who will be left with chronic hypoxia and cognitive deficits. In adults, muscle mass and weakness, like in any chronic bedridden illness, are fairly common. Mortality in adults, it has come down in the last decade from somewhere in the 40 to 60 percent to the current clinical trials that are reporting mortalities in the range of around mid-20s. In children, the important thing about mortalities in, and in adults and children is death from ARDS is related to multi-organ dysfunction. Very few people die from ARDS because of hypoxemia. It's less than 20%. So even though we think of it as a disease of the lungs, it is actually a systemic illness. And the mortality and prognosis is more driven by the degree and extent of that multi-organ failure and the systemic involvement in ARDS rather than by uh, hypoxia alone. Patients who have cancer and bone marrow transplant uh, have his, historically had reported mortalities of 86%, about only a decade to 15 years ago. But in our data, both in our institutional studies and on studies based on databases like VPS across thousands of patients, we know that in today's day, the mortality in those cancer BMT patients has gone down to about 40% or so. What determines the outcome of these patients with ARDS? Obviously, oxygenation metrics, whether you look at PF ratio or OI, has been related to a, a, a mortality in both adults and children time and uh, over again. Number of organ failures, whether you have just respiratory failure or two or more organ failures or three or more organ failures, plays in a lo long, a big way into uh, outcome. However, these data are again from the last decade or so. So these numbers, if anything, would be much better today, except that the trends with the increasing organ system failure leading to increased mortality are still uh, relevant. Pre-existing comorbidities play a big role in uh, prognosis, and then severity of illness scores will relate whether it is PRISM in children or Apache in uh, adults, do still predict mortality in patients with ARDS. The risk of mortality to a large degree, other than individuals, is related to how you got the ARDS. And this again has been shown over and over again, that if you have sepsis, or as a cause of ARDS, you're much more likely to die versus if you got ARDS because you had trauma. Why is prognosis important? So we've delved a little bit more into this. What are the factors that predict mortality in an individual patient? And it's important because it's important for counseling families it's important because we have to make decisions about whether patients should be subject to high-risk therapies like CRRT or ECLS. And hopefully in future for stratification for clinical trials, who are the patients who should be subject to a particular treatment versus not. And we've looked at this, predictors of mortality in a cohort, multi-institutional uh, cohort of about 300 
ARDS patients. And as expected, we found that we did in univariate analysis that PRISM score, degree of organ failure is related to mortality. Whether you have cancer or uh, stem cell transplant is related to mortality, and oxygen uh, oxygenation index is related to mortality. But when you put all these things into a multivariate model, the only two independent predictors of mortality are cancer, HST, history, and oxygenation index. This is data from day one. What happens if you now resuscitated the patient, given him some therapies, and look at data from day three? Again, same group of, um, so at day three, same group of variables, the, uh, the PRISM score, the uh, organ dysfunction scores, cancer HSCT and OI, and on day three, by day three, how much fluid you have given to the child also matters. If the, if the patient's cumulative fluid balance is high, they are more likely to die. But again, in a multivariate analysis, just the two things that stand out is cancer, HST, and oxygenation index. So Aaron Spicer, who did most of the work on this uh, particular project, was tasked to find a, a simple and robust bedside model of prediction that clinicians could use to, for all these purposes, whether counseling families or deciding whether the patient goes into ECLS or whether he qualifies for a particular high-risk therapy clinical trial or not, did multiple models and found that a model based just on OI and a history of cancer HSAT performs as well as complex models with multiple variables and complex uh, calculations, whether you talk about PRISM or PLOD or any such thing. And in a model adjusted for age, gender, and race, he found the predicted probability of death was linear as the oxygen indi uh, OI index uh, went uh, uh, with the increasing oxygenation index. So what about management? The management of ARDS is basically elementary um, a resuscitation, ABCs. So airway and uh, breathing go together. Most of the times they will need to be intubated just for providing mechanical ventilation. And for mechanical ventilation, the only two things that matter are that you have to use a tidal volume of less than six and PF ratio that is adequate to achieve oxygenation. You need to support their circulation, diagnose and treat the underlying condition, empiric therapy for sepsis, and time and again, if you feed the patients or use gut for nutrition that is supposed to have better outcomes than using TPN. It doesn't matter whether you use trophic feeds alone or you give full feeds. There has been a randomized clinical trial in ARDS patients, and both have equivalent outcomes. So, so what is the evidence that we have other than this recess, basic resuscitation in patients with ARDS? This is a review article that appeared two years ago. I strongly suggest reading both the article and watching the movie also, which is quite good. So what it did was it looked at the randomized clinical trials that have been done in ARDS. And this slide is not meant to be read. It is just to, to emphasize that almost everything that you can think of has been tried and evaluated in randomized clinical trials. And of the 150 or so randomized clinical trials that we have had in ARDS, there are just three or four that have had positive results. And so today, for all comers of ARDS, without differentiating any uh, based on any kind of clinical classification. If you take everybody who meets the criteria of ARDS, the only therapies that have proven in well-conducted randomized trials over and over again are lung protective ventilation, the tidal volume, prone positioning, muscle relaxants, and fluid management. So I think over the next five to seven minutes, I'll go over these trials and then we'll 
uh, come to an end. Um, so that we can leave a few minutes for questions. So this trial was based on randomizing patients with ARDS to reduce tidal volumes versus normal tidal volumes. And I show this data to emphasize a point. This is looking at the PF ratio of patients. These, the blue ones are the ones that are randomized to high tidal volume, and the red ones are those that are randomized to low tidal volumes. And the, the hypothesis of the study was that, hypo, that low tidal volumes are beneficial, and we should be ventilating with low tidal volumes. But these patients were hypoxic. This was the respiratory rate on these patients. The patients on low tidal volume were panting, had high respiratory rates as compared to the low tidal volumes. Their plateau pressures, of course, were lower. But when they randomized these patients to low tidal volumes, for the first few days, they had hypoxic and panting patients. But God bless those investigators for believing in the science and persisting with the clinical trial. Because what happened is when the DSMB did an interim analysis, the trial was not complete, they did an interim analysis and found a significant difference in mortality. These patients that were hypoxic and panting had a much better survival than those patients who looked comfortable and well oxygenated with high tidal volumes. And the trial was stopped because it was no longer believed to be ethical to uh, randomizing patients because low tidal volume had shown such a big benefit. One of the rare trials that had such a big effect in critical care medicine. So the obvious result, obvious uh, thing to uh, take away from this stu uh, study would be that high tidal volumes were damaging lungs and you were uh, breaking apart their lungs and somehow that translated into mortality. But actually when you look at the data, this is showing medium organ free failure free days. So out of 28 days, how many days was this particular organ failing or not. So the organ failure free days, if you have more of those, that's a good thing. And you could see that low tidal volume ventilation was not just affecting the lungs. It had a improvement across the systems. And that takes us back to the same concept that ARDS is a systemic illness. People die from multi-organ failure. And this lung protective ventilation, what it was doing was preventing patients from getting, uh, uh, getting multi-organ failure. And when they looked at the, uh, some of the plasma levels of inflammatory mediators, it turned out that all these things were decreased in plasma of patients with low tidal volume. So low tidal volumes just do not help the lungs but they help the degree of inflammation systemically, and that's how they are beneficial. Has it changed practice? Yes, we looked at our own data. Uh, data published from our uh, centers, comparable centers between 2005 and 2016, tidal volumes have gone from 10.3 to 7.3. However, we're not there yet. Less than a third of patients get the idealized body weight tidal volume. And to, even today, about 40% of patients get less than eight, get more than eight cc's tidal volume. So there is room for improvement, though we have made long ways. However, none of these RCTs has been done in children, and the ideal oxygenation for the developing brain is not known. Number uh, second intervention, the fluid management in children. So uh, in, in children or in ARDS in general. So this was a randomized controlled trial that randomized patients to a CVP of less than four or 14 and basically resulted in a decrease in the number of, number of uh, ventilator free days, though it did not have a statistically significant effect on mortality, but decreased the number of ventilator free days and ICU days in adults. Uh, 
So we looked at what do we do in children? Do we follow fluid liberal or fluid uh, conservative therapy? These two are the conservative arm, the cumulative fluid balance and the conservative arm of FACT trial. This is the fluid balance in the liberal arm of conservative, uh, a liberal arm of the fluid uh, management trial. For a long time, pediatricians believed that we were fluid conservative. But when we looked at this data, it turns out that we are even more liberal than the liberal arm of FACT trial. So, and not only that, that the day three fluid balance was, was associated with mortality in a multivariate regression, independent of the severity of illness and age of the ch child. This was, uh, this was followed up by a study where we looked at cumulative fluid balance alone as a marker of mortality in patients with uh, ARDS. So we looked at the, these are box plots of fluid balance at day three uh, in fluid balance in liters per meter square stratified by survivors and non-survivors. So clearly non-survivors have a higher cumulative fluid balance. But then we ask the question, we know that acute kidney injury is also associated with increased mortality in patients with ARDS. And we looked at patients that had no acute kidney injury and had acute kidney injury. And turns out that patients with acute kidney injury also have increased fluid balance. So in order to separate this effect, whether this effect on mortality was from fluid balance versus acute kidney injury, we stratified these patients. We looked at fluid balance in patients without acute kidney injury and with acute kidney injury. And what this shows is that cumulative fluid balance is associated with mortality only if you have AKI. And we looked at it a different way also. Now instead of stratifying patients whether they had acute kidney injury because acute kidney injury would have uh, increased fluid balance, we stratified patients with AKI and without AKI. And then we differentiated them based on the quartile of fluid balance. So the, the, this is where do they fall in the quartile of fluid balance. So even in patients with similar fluid balance, if they don't have AKI, there is no change in mortality. Only patients who have AKI, they, if you increase their fluid that they're associated with increased fluid uh, mortality. So this was a concept that has not been looked at in children, in, in adults also, because the FACT trial included every patient with, uh, um, with increased, uh, every patient with ARDS and did not differentiate patients with AKI or no AKI. So based on this data, we conclude that mortality is associated with increasing fluid balance, that attention to cumulative fluid balance and fluid conservative ma management may be important, especially in patients with AKI. And we are now currently looking at the FACT database that actually did a conservative fluid balance uh, management in children with ARDS, in, not in children, but in adults with ARDS to see if there was a differential effect of that fluid conservative management in patients with ARDS versus not. The other two majors that I talked about, prone positioning and muscle relaxants, have shown clear benefit in, in, uh, in, uh, in ARDS. And then in select group of patients, any of these therapies, whether you talk about high PEEP, inhaled NO, steroids, surfactant, or CVBH, um, and uh, uh, ECLS, these are, none of these uh, therapies has been proven, but in a select group of patients, especially with the refractory hypoxemia, where you have uh, uh, your back turned towards the wall, these therapies may be useful in select group of patients, but not in all comers of ALI. And finally, to let you know that uh, we have currently a trial undergoing, we meaning my ex-mentor and his group at UCSF, of stem cells uh, 
ongoing phase two clinical trial of mesenchymal stem cells. The mesenchymal stem cells do not go back and populate the alveoli, but it seems that they have paracrine effects that may be beneficial in ARDS. And they have completed, so this all started in 2007 with mouse work, which we don't have time to go through, and has resulted in a phase one clinical trial that has um, improved, uh, that has been just a safety uh, endpoint, and there were no infusion-associated adverse events, no trends uh, observed in terms of adverse events, but there was non -st statistically non-significant benefit, which has now resulted in a phase two trial 50 of 60 scheduled patients have been uh, enrolled and stay tuned for uh, the results. I'll stop here and take any questions.